All right, welcome back everybody to the main stage. What an amazing day, jam-packed speakers, companies. Hopefully you had a great time, learned a lot. We're here for our last session, Regulatory Issues in Ethereum and Web3. So I have the honor of introducing John Whelan, EEA, Chairman of the Board. And John's gonna take this session over about 20 minutes. We're gonna have the uh, exhibit hall open for the next hour after that. So please stick around after this session and John's gonna close us out as well. So John, over to you, thanks to you and your speakers. Um, James, thank you very much indeed. And great to see everybody again. Uh, some of you already know me. My name is John Whelan. I am the chairman of the board of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, but in my day job, uh, I am the managing director of the digital assets program at uh, Grupo Santander in Madrid. Uh, you know, I'm a practitioner like all of you I'm doing these things for real. And as you all know, uh, one of the uh, main challenges we have for implementing crypto and blockchain and uh, smart contracts initiatives in the enterprise relates to legal and regulatory challenges. And in that regard, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Gabriella Kush from the Global Digital Assets and Cryptocurrency Association and Marta Belcher from Protocol Labs, aka Filecoin. Um, let me start with Gabriella. Maybe, Gabriella, you can tell us a little bit about DCA and a couple of sentences about yourself. Sure, of course. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, just to kind of give a bit of a background, um, mine is a bit unique in the digital assets. Uh, you know, the majority of my career has been in international economic and financial sector development. So I did a lot around the financial sector transformation um, post the fall of communism and really ushering in capital markets um, with a focus on transparency, accountability, and good governance. Um, I've worked in 50 different countries and supported self-regulatory movements um, in the accounting and financial reporting and auditing sector. And uh, about two years ago, got engaged with a group of grassroots industry actors uh, and came together and put on the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association. So today we're 70 members. We represent all verticals of the industry. Our focus is on stewardship of responsible innovation and advancement of you know, a balanced regulatory environment. Outstanding. Thank you. Marta, you're with Filecoin, General Counsel. Um, Filecoin is one of the original OGs, original gangsters in, in the crypto world. Maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the current status of Protocol Labs slash Filecoin and uh, a little bit about yourself. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I am both the general counsel of Protocol Labs and separately, I'm also the chair of the Filecoin Foundation. Um, and um, Filecoin is, uh, I, I like to describe it uh, as Airbnb for file storage. So the idea is you can pay people with Filecoin uh, to store your files um, and you can get paid with Filecoin um, for storing uh, other people's files. And what that does is it creates the incentive layer for the decentralized web. So it gives people the incentive to um, put their hardware onto a network and actually create the infrastructure that enables a new version of the web um, that is decentralized. Um, so that is that is what I am working on and, and what I'm doing. I'm also, um, in my spare time, special counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where I do civil liberties and cryptocurrency work. Excellent. Um, let's start with the difficult questions. Gabriella, um, it sounds like you work globally, um, long experience, uh, extensive background in international uh, regulatory issues. Can you give us in a short version i know it's complex but can you give us a short version of what's the general state of regulatory perspectives and approaches globally to crypto digital assets blockchain sure so at a, a very high level macro view i think what you're looking at is governments all over the world um, trying to grapple with the idea of how to navigate um, digital asset legal and regulatory um, and also just i think this broader philosophy around decentralization, okay? Um, in the first instance, what we're seeing is that many jurisdictions are trying to shoehorn in a lot of the digital asset space, the broader DeFi era into existing legal and regulatory frameworks. And you know what we're finding is that when you begin down that road, you very quickly realize that you're not just looking at a different asset class in terms of you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the other types of cryptocurrencies, 
but really you're looking at a fundamental transformation of the financial sector. And that's a move away from centralized entities upon which a regulator can focus their enforcement actions, their surveillance, and towards a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized system. And so, you know, very rapidly, I think a lot of the jurisdictions who are kind of in the lead. So I'm looking at jurisdictions like Switzerland. I'm looking at the United Arab Emirates. I'm looking at, you know, key jurisdictions in Asia and even, you know, countries like Uganda and other African countries that are recognizing the potential that there is um, around decentralization, around Web3, and really being able to build on you know, not just the cryptocurrency component of this, but allow this to bring forward like a broader transformation in the digital economy. And so if they recognize that, then they understand that in order to regulate or to, I would say, maybe even reimagine what it means to regulate, they have to kind of themselves embody some of that decentralized element. And so what you're seeing is sort of either a creation at times of a self-regulatory model that allows that flexibility, that nimbleness, that ability to go uh, cross border and to really follow and engage and balance the need for innovation in the space with the need for consumer protection. Um, alternatively, you're seeing the creation of, I think, kind of nuanced or, you know, again, reimagined versions of what it means to regulate and be a regulator. So if I'm looking to the United Arab Emirates, that's the creation of whole new regulatory entities that are bringing forward, I think, a nuanced philosophy around how and in what way to engage, how to support the community that underpins a lot of what we're seeing in the digital asset and digital economy and to ensure that you're bringing the jobs, the opportunity, um, the security, and really the prosperity, the citizens that is needed around the world and really what is the true benefit of, of all of this, Ethereum and Web3. So all of this hinges, this, this transformation we're talking about, all, all of this hinges on this topic of decentralization. And decentralization itself is somewhat of an amorphous concept, but in many ways speaks to the uh, distribution of power and control back to the ind individual. Uh, it's a civil liberties uh, question. Um, Marta, from a civil liberties point of view, and, and Filecoin obviously is a civil liberties tool in many respects, um, do you is this a topic that 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 uh, concerns let's say Filecoin Filecoin Foundation um, this idea of uh, putting control back into the hands of people and how do you think about that? Well, I think civil liberties um, should really be at the heart of what um, you know every everyone in the crypto space should be thinking about. I think it's really core to the ethos of, of why cryptocurrency exists. Um, and a lot of the work that I do with the Electronic Frontier Foundation is really about um, uh, civil liberties here. I think um, there is uh, uh, increasingly a push um, in the United States and also around the world um, to take the, uh, the financial surveillance of the traditional banking system and really push it on to cryptocurrency. Um, and, and that is something I think we should be, we should be really, um, we should be really wary of. I think there is this idea that privacy is, is bad and tools that enhance privacy um, enable crime. But, but privacy and anonymity aren't bad or illegal. They're absolutely essential for civil liberties. And, and that's especially true for financial transactions. Um, so a lot of my work um, in, the, in the civil liberty space revolves around um, financial surveillance, um, financial censorship, um, and really fighting for civil liberties um, as it applies to cryptocurrency. Do you see particular jurisdictions that are more pro-civil liberties versus anti-civil liberties? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think it, it depends on the issue, right? Um, I, I think it's funny because you'll see, um, sometimes you'll see that there are um, there are contradictions. And just to give you one example, um, Europe, home of GDPR, right? Really thinking about um, data protection. At the same time, you're seeing some really anti-privacy uh, kinds of um, uh, proposals coming out in the cryptocurrency space, right? Um, so, so you you know you you will often get um, it, things that are that things that are uh, uh, you know not exactly uh, aligned, um, and you'll have things on both sides of the spectrum come out. Um, same thing in the U.S., right? Um, we we see in the United States. Um, really, I mean, the, the government has really been increasingly pushing um, to expand surveillance um, of cryptocurrency, um, really to, to the type that we see in the traditional banking system. And, and that's been something that I've been very concerned with. Gabriella, 
a few moments ago, you mentioned a term that I think I understand, but maybe could use some clarification. You use the term self-regulation. Yeah. Um, describe what the industry can do. I'm sure we can do better, but describe what the industry can do around this concept of self-regulation and really what does it mean for industry participants to, to self-regulate? Sure. Um, well, it, it's a really good question because I think there is, you know, some misunderstanding at times about what that means. I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about, you know, Ethereum and the Ethereum community, the entire Web3 movement is the community there and really leveraging that community to come together to identify standards, good practices that can help shape a pathway for building resilient systems, for building, you know, globally competitive products and services that really ultimately deliver the benefits that we'd like to see from this transformative technology. Um, I think when we talk about self-regulation, I often look at a, a softer view of it. And it's really about partnering with firms in order to help them understand how they can build up and ensure the longevity um, of their you know, business model and also the innovation that drives kind of the next wave of product and services that come out um, and really helping them you know, as partners to build up um, this community even, even more than it is today. Um, I think in the first instance, it's always about education because education is kind of that first cornerstone, the first like form of defense against, you know, fraud, abuse, um, and, and illicit behavior. Um, but I think, you know, building on that education to then work with the community to help enhance their businesses is kind of that second piece. And then the third piece is really, you know, working together almost as a gardener, as opposed to this adversarial, you know, cop on the block type of a of a you know outmoded form of, of regulation but really looking at it from a standpoint of you know if we're trying to shape this amazing technology and what it can bring around the world then we need to start to identify how we can help build that pathway how do we shape the garden that will bring the fruits of our labors forward and really help to i think usher in a new era and a transformative opportunity for humanity um, Marta, you mentioned the apparent contradiction, let's say, in the European Union between the privacy, civil libertarian approach to personal data that is GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and the recent votes that we've seen in the European Parliament. These are politicians, not regulators, they're politicians related to, uh, you know, concepts around um, personal wallets and, and, and privacy, etc. And, and, and you also mentioned the uh, apparent contradictions in the United States. Do you get a sense that there is a dialogue happening behind the scenes with global regulators about a common approach to these issues? Or do you think that each regulator is going their own direction and it's kind of a, it's, you know, it's a random accident of chance that things might appear to be coordinated? I think it's both. Um, I think it's, I think there are a lot of efforts, um, you know, and, and a lot of people um, uh, deserve, I think, a lot of credit for um, a lot of coordination efforts um, across the board. Th things today are just absolutely night and day compared to how they were five years ago. Um, just to give you one example, we recently in the United States have the executive order from President Biden that um, I think did a really terrific job of saying, okay, we're not gonna just jump in and create regulations around cryptocurrency. What we're gonna do is have all of these different agencies um, across the federal government start looking at at and studying the space um, and, and really have this measured approach of all of these different agencies at once, um, gathering information, making recommendations, having a slow process um, whereby we can try to get to some uh, coordinated uh, uh, set of regulations on the other end um, in, a, in a sort of much slower and more thoughtful manner. And so I think you do see um, a, a quite a lot of very, sometimes you will see very sudden policy changes that have had absolutely, you know, almost no warning, right? So there have been must, in the United States, for example, there have been these must pass bills um, and, and you'll get a cryptocurrency provision shoved in at the last minute that no one in the industry has seen that fundamentally actually alters the way that the industry is gonna have to behave. And, and you know, just with absolutely no um, opportunity for amendment. Um, so I think it happens both ways <laughs> and it's messy. 
So we've mentioned, you know, the big industrial economies, the United States and the European Union, but the world is not just the USA and the EU, right? It's it's much, much bigger. We've got a, uh, many um, large portions of the, the global community in developing countries. Um, Gabriella, from your work, and I'm sure you've worked across Latin America, Africa, and parts of Asia, um, do you see that uh, uh, developing economies are also taking these topics seriously from a regulatory point of view? And also perhaps are they sensing the opportunity for, for maybe um, important topics for them, which might be financial inclusion, unbanked, underbanked? Um, where's the opportunity there? Sure. You know, I think um, with the forthcoming, you know, fourth industrial revolution, there's been a recognition that this is an opportunity. You know, during the original industrial revolution, you saw a lot of emerging economies, you know, be able to produce raw materials, but it was really the higher value, um, you know, works in progress or finished products that were, you know, giving economic growth and opportunity. And so I think here, many countries are rightly recognizing the need to position well from a legal and regulatory standpoint um, to be able to have, uh, you know, a balanced regulatory approach. So one that, yes, protects consumers, but also is willing to keep businesses, you know, within their jurisdiction to help develop domestic industry to ensure that there's not a brain drain that, you know, leaves the countries and takes with it all of the economic growth, jobs and opportunity. And, you know, with that, I think gives opportunity for those countries to kind of take a next step, both in terms of global positioning, but also um, in terms of their own competitiveness. Um, I think, you know, in the first order, you saw if we're looking at some countries like India or Nigeria, for example, um, I think initially you saw a lot of, um, you know, a banning or a push or even sort of a uh, very adversarial uh, positioning by government initially. And I think that that started to chill um, the investment. It caused a number of businesses to go overseas. And then once those you know, policymakers and parliamentarians recognized that flow was shifting, they all of a sudden started to kind of back off or some of them even backtracked their statements. And so what you saw then was a recognition in India, for example, that there should be a taxation on um, digital assets and you know, a certain implied legality around it. And then also you know, similarly, um, in Nigeria. And so I think, you know, in these jurisdictions, they had tried uh, many times to kind of pump the brakes to give their regulators a chance to catch up. And when they recognized that that pumping of the brakes was actually causing an outflow of economic opportunity, that's when they started to, I think, realize that there needed to be a balance. And I think they're still working through that, as we can see in both of the jurisdictions that I've just mentioned, um, as well as jurisdictions around the world. It's still an evolution process. We're still trying to understand um, how best to regulate this space. And I think that that will be for the next at least five, five years or more. Um, and that's just due to the fact that this is still an evolving space. Um, Gabriella, I understand you need to jump off a little bit early. So if you, if you do need to drop, by the way, I want to thank you immensely. Um, there's an opportunity for another conversation, I hope. Enjoy the rest of your day. Marta, um, you're a lawyer. Um, you spend, I'm sure, most of your day, as I do these days, <laughs> trying to understand regulations in different jurisdictions, um, whether they're existing regulations, looking at proposed future regulations, or maybe even thinking about how do we respond to the proposed future regulations. What is your suggestion to, let's say, corporate practitioners in the field that might be in legal departments, could be in compliance, or even public policy? Uh, about the best way to engage with regulators on these topics. Is there, a, is there kind of a, 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 is there a best practice approach to engaging directly with regulators on these topics? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a couple, like a multi-pronged approach. I think the first is there are some amazing groups that are, are out there that are making a big difference um, and that are, are doing a really good job of engaging directly with policymakers and are also doing a really good job of coordinating the industry um, in, in being able to, to, to actually have a unified voice. 
I think that's something that is so, so important and is something that we are, as an industry, we are getting closer to, but is something that we are not, um, you know, that, that is definitely a work in progress. So like, just to give you an example, if you are a legislator and you have a proposal um, on the table about guns, right? There is a very powerful lobby group in the United States, the NRA, right? And you you go to the NRA and you know that uh, if the NRA says X, that is what the gun lobby, that is that is it. That is like what the gun lobby wants, right? Um, and it's a very, very, you know, whatever side you're on on it, it's a very powerful group, right? Um, unfortunately, in the cryptocurrency space, imagine being a imagine being a regulator in the cryptocurrency space, or imagine being a lawmaker, a member of Congress, and you're you're you have some draft legislation, and you go to the industry, and what happens is you get back. You know, there are ten different industry groups. There are twenty others who aren't members of industry groups. They're all sending you different edits. They're all taking different positions. It actually puts you in a, a you know, a, like it puts you in a bad position as a lawmaker, but it puts the entire industry in a bad position because you have um, different different groups contradicting each other, not able to really present a united front. Um, so my view is, I hope that we 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 certainly are already moving towards a much more unified voice as an industry, but I hope we will continue to do that. And I think that is a um, best practice that is something that we are um, uh, we will we will greatly benefit from. Yeah, we've seen that in the financial industry, for example, we have industry bodies that are lobbying groups, essentially like the GFMA, Global Financial Markets Association. Um, it's happened over years and years and years, but it kind of it kind of makes sense. Um, we are right on time, folks. I'm going to ask Marta one final question. Um, 2022, we're about, you know, one third of, well, we're a quarter of the way in, maybe a third of the way in. Um, what's the most interesting regulatory topic you think on the radar screen for the remainder of the year? Where should people in this industry start to pay some attention? You know, um, I think I see it with, uh, you know, as a, as a civil liberties advocate, I am definitely, uh, I am definitely biased. Um, and I have a particular, uh, you know, civil liberties colored glasses on. Um, but, but really what I think um, for me, the thing that is keeping me up at night is I think that governments around the world um, have really been increasingly um, uh, trying to take the existing uh, uh, surveillance and censorship of the traditional financial system um, and apply it to cryptocurrencies. I think they're also making it much harder to have um, private transactions um, as a matter of course. Um, and it's something that I'm I'm very concerned about. I'm also, you know, very concerned about um, the ability of people to, to transact and to, to hold their own funds and not have to go through um, custodians in all cases. So um, this is an area that I'm thinking a lot about. And I think there's going to be, there are Already has been a lot of movement in 2022 and i think there's going to be a lot more and i think about a lot of, a lot about these topics as well uh, um i think part of the challenge is you know defining some of the terminology that is not antagonistic towards crypto uh even the term unhosted wallet versus personal wallet um personal wallet should probably be a uh, fundamental uh, human right <laughs> um that's not santander's point of view that might be john's uh marta Thank you very much indeed. Greatly appreciate your participation. Uh, I've no doubt our paths will cross at probably some crypto conference somewhere and we'll be discussing these interesting topics. I want to say thank you uh, profoundly to our audience, uh, the members of the EA and non-members who've joined us. Uh, we are right on time. And I would suggest if you have an extra few minutes to go back and visit the exhibit hall. Um, lots of interesting things there to examine and learn new topics. I'm going to jump right in myself. Uh, and to uh, Marta Belcher and to Gabriella Kush, thank you very much indeed. We'll see you all soon. Thank you so much, John.